Good morning, everyone. Um, let me just start off, you know, to liven things up uh, with some questions, trivia questions. There won't be any prizes, but then I uh, just want to see whether the audience is uh, familiar with some of the uh, businesses that are doing thriving these days, uh, especially the new businesses. Okay, there's a nation which is about three years old. Nation which is about three years old, but it has one billion population. Can you tell me what the nation is called? Anyone has a name for the nation? Three years old, one billion population. Anybody? Everyone's, come again? No, no, it's not chat, it's Facebook. Facebook yeah, is a nation which is only three years old, but it's got one, uh, pop, one billion population in the last three years. And um, there is also a university. There's a university out there that has got 45 million students. Have you heard of this university? 45 million students. No. No, it's not Google. No, it's not Google. Google is, uh, yeah, I mean, you can get some information from Google, of course. Lots of information, but this is an actual, in a way, university. It is an actual university. It's not Harvard, it's not Oxford, it's not Cambridge. Anybody? It's called Khan Academy. You've heard of Khan Academy, okay? It's got 45 million students. Now, the thing is, uh, there's this gentleman who wanted to teach his nephew algebra, and from that, this whole academy came out, and now it's got 45 million students. And uh, do you know the value of Instagram? Instagram, the value of Instagram? It's about a billion. It's only three years old, and it's a billion uh, US dollars. New York Times, which is a century old company, is worth around 800 to 900 million. So what I'm trying to get at here is, there's something called disruptive innovation which is happening. So most businesses have to get into this domain. They need to start disrupting the business. They cannot be doing business the same way as what they were doing before. And this is where IP comes in, this is where the valuation also comes in. So when a business which is fairly new just started and they're doing so well and they're looking into, you know, they're, they're, in, they're doing business in terms of billions and you have very old companies that is just worth a fraction of it. Uh, another example would be Airbnb. They have no single, they don't even have a hotel, but they have a million rooms. Hilton Hotel has been around for so long, and they have about 600,000 rooms. JW Marriott is trying to increase the room, uh, the number of rooms by 2,000 in the next two years. Airbnb is doing that in two weeks' time, in within two weeks. So the point here is disruptive in innovation is here to stay. Companies that does not disturb the business will not last. I think you've heard of uh, Nokia's and uh, the Kodak's, where they did not really innovate too much, and uh, what happened was they've just gone off the radar. So when you have this sort of disruptive innovation, one of the key important things that needs to be looked into is the IP aspect. IP prosecution is something very common. I mean, we've done that, and that's what most of you all over here, IP practitioners, you've protected it. But now you need to put a value to it as well. And the strategy has to be right. The IP strategy has to be right. Because without the IP strategy, without a proper IP strategy, they will not be able to actually have a value which I just mentioned. I'm just going to share with you these case studies. I've also got a local case study as well over there. This is what I mentioned earlier, where Hilton was founded in 1919. And they, had, you know, they have got about 600,000 over rooms. And the valuation for Hilton in 2015 is, not, is about 25 billion. And Airbnb is valued at 20 to 22 billion. And the rooms that they have is about 1.5 million over here. Similarly, this is something closer to home uh, in Malaysia, where we have uh, Sunlight Taxi, which operates taxis. They got about 4,000 over taxis. Uber, by the way, is also in Malaysia, but uh, Uber is having a bit of a tough time because some of these traditional taxis, when they see someone driving a Uber car, they actually smash up the car. I'm not joking. So in Malaysia, when you take Uber, you've got to be a bit careful uh, because the traditional taxi drivers are not leaving them, uh, not giving them an easy time. Okay, anyway, there was this Sunlight Taxi, and it's worth so much. And then my taxi came in in about 2011, and they managed to actually get some funding from a venture capitalist. Uh, they've got, I think, if I'm not mistaken, about 90 million from a venture capitalist. 
So a fairly new company, and they managed to get about 90 million. One of the ways is through IP valuation. Although it is a fairly new company, but they managed to have a valuation done. Uh, Malaysia is now recognizing IP valuation. They have actually come up with the IP valuation policy. And uh, when a, f a, a figure was given and the VC saw a potential in it, they actually invested such, such an amount. Close to home itself, it was a success story in Malaysia. This is another, I mean, Walmart and Alibaba, I think everyone knows this. Walmart has got many stores. Alibaba has got no stores at all. Uh, but however, the value of Alibaba, where it's about, uh, it's worth, I think, around 50 billion. Uh, again, when Alibaba wants to increase its capital, it wants to, uh, you know, uh, get investors in, it will not be a problem at all because of the valuation that the company has. Okay, I'm just going to skip this. Okay, now, as I mentioned earlier, where these emerging technologies are concerned, one of the things is you need to get into this disruptive mode, um, in disruptive innovation, where you can actually come up with a quick value generation, and that's what the examples that I gave you earlier has done. Uh, in a very short span of time, uh, the companies have actually been able to get such a huge amount of value for the intangible assets rather than having any uh, tangible assets like a building. So, so one of the things is what you know I've been mentioning is uh, putting the IP in place is key over here. Relying on creating value through intellectual property, intangible assets, uh, for example, patents, trademark, copyright, industrial design, depending on the offerings. IP securitization is also another way of monetizing the uh, the you know uh, an IP. Uh, loans can be, you can actually get loans from your patents or trademarks. There's also something else called bonds, where there was very successfully Bowie, there's something called Bowie Bond. And about 15 years back, there was a singer where he thought was he's got copyright. And with TPP coming in, I mean, copyright protection has been extended from 50 years to 70 years. And Malaysia is also part of TPP, Trans Pacific uh, Partnership. But there's a problem for the, for the artist where copyright is concerned. It's 50, it's 50 or 70 years after the death of the artist. So while, yeah, the protection is very long, but some of the artists may not be able to benefit from the royalties that comes in at a later stage. So um, like Michael Jackson, for example, when he, was, when he was alive, there were stories about him actually uh, going into bankruptcy. But now, last year, if you look at the artist that who's made a lot of money after the death, Michael Jackson is on top. I think he made about 200 million, if I'm not mistaken, last year. So what, what this uh, particular singer, David Bowie, has done is um, he actually came up with something, and now it's called Bowie Bond. He came up with a bond where he had IP securitization for his video, for his album that he's going to release. And he actually sold it as a bond, and he managed to make whatever money that he would have made after his death, he managed to make the money at the initial stage. So this is one of the ways of how somebody has actually benefited from IP, IP and due securitization. And, uh, and this is also being seen in Malaysia now. They are actually looking into something like this, uh, into a policy of this, where they are look, talking to the artists and seeing whether the artists can actually benefit from the IPs that they have while they're alive instead of after the death. Now, even to get VC funding, um, IP is important because when you want to get a VC funding and if you do not have your IPs in place, it will be difficult for you to convince them to actually invest into your technologies because it will be easy for another person to just entry barrier for another person would be fairly simple. So where VC funding is also another way of monetizing your IP, and that's why I told you this uh, example of something very close to home. My taxi has been able to raise, actually it was not 50, but 90 million USD in 2014 through VCs. Now also through accusation of big companies, when you have your IPs in place, you can also have accusations like, by big companies. And uh, Cambridge Antibody Technology acquired AstraZeneca for 1.5 billion USD. Now, in Malaysia, another thing is uh, why IPs are also filed is the government gives out funding for 
promoting local innovations. And uh, when they have an IP attached to the technologies that they've come up with, then the chances of them getting fundings is also greater. So that's another way of a person trying to monetize from the patents, namely patents, because uh, the technology, the grants are normally given for technologies. Okay, that's it. That's my speech for today. I've, I'm actually got about five minutes extra. So, uh, if there's any questions, I'll take the questions a bit later. Thank you.